Behold, the bridegroom cometh. Go ye out to meet him. Now is the time to trim your lamps and get ready for the coming of the Lord. Stay tuned for the Midnight Cry broadcast. I expect most everyone tonight feels probably the same way I do. Who can stand up here after the things that we've sung, the things that the Lord has emphasized in our midst tonight? We began with just a reminder of who Jesus is. You know, I remember in our recent trip just sitting in the hotel one day and, and just the thought just really gripped me for a time that who Jesus is is the dividing point of humanity. I mean, how you stand, how everybody in, the, in history stands with respect to Jesus determines everything. They're either with him or they're against him. There's no middle ground. There's ab it's absolutely all with Jesus or it's nothing at all. And, uh, you know, if Jesus is just a religious teacher that people can, you know, decide, hey, I like your philosophy, I think I'd like to live by your principles, that's, you know, you can take him or leave him. But if Jesus is who he says he is, then there's an absolute choice to be made. We are either going to serve him or we're not. And, you know, when the apostles were sent forth into the world to begin to proclaim the gospel, they had an uncompromising message, didn't they? It was basically the same thing Jesus said, repent or perish. But they didn't have to go out and just try to persuade men with logic. In the first place, they had the anointing upon them. It was, it's, it's God's job to convict you. It's not my job to, to, get, to spin fancy words here and tell you all about it and just wow your mind so, so that you'll just be swayed to embrace what I'm saying. It's God's job to go out and convict you. And I pray that he will work with hearts. I know there's been prayer to that, to that effect because you know, that's, nothing happens apart from that. Uh, I, I, going in two threads here, let me, let me finish the thought that I had that when they went out and began to preach about Jesus, their message was simple. God has borne witness to Jesus. And the way he did that was to raise him from the dead. Now, you can look through history, you'll never find another religious teacher that was raised from the dead, but Jesus was. And at the time they began to proclaim the message, there were literally hundreds of eyewitnesses to the reality that Jesus had bodily been raised from the dead. They touched him. They ate with him. This was not some, fa some fiction they concocted, some scam that they pulled on history. Boy, there's a lot of people today that would like to somehow manipulate history and, and make it all different than it really is. But Jesus is the divine Son of God. Amen. He is everything that we saw on that little video. He is our creator. Amen. He is the one who gathered Israel and walked with them and sought their fellowship and their love and was spurned by the nation as a whole. He is the one who entered history as Jesus, the Son of God who gave his life in our place. You know, when he came, something different entered history. We read in Isaiah the prophecy, and I think we're seeing a fulfillment again of this, but we, uh, I believe its first fulfillment was at the time of Jesus entered the world. Darkness was, upon, was, was in the world. Gross darkness the people that's the effect of sin that's the effect of the rule of the wicked spirits that rule this world that's the power under which men fell when they turned their backs upon God and wicked spirits began to take over and to rule and to blind and to cause men not to be able to see and so men measured their goodness by each other at best you know, you can always look around and find somebody worse, and you can certainly say, well, I'm no better than they are. I must be okay. But when Jesus came, that changed. All of a sudden, God was living among them. His spirit, his light, his life began to come in contact with people, and they, most of them didn't like it. They, they loved the illusion of their own goodness. They wanted it. I mean, the essence of sin is self on the throne. 
It's me doing what I want to do. But Jesus came with a different message. It was a message of dying so that you could live. Take up your cross every day and follow me. There's no other way to life. There is no compromise in the message of the gospel. We are seeing a so-called gospel being preached widely in our day that does not demand true repentance. It never causes men to face their sins. It's a nice, sweet, lovely, accept Jesus kind of so-called gospel that men just blow right past so they can get to all the good stuff they really want to do, religiously speaking. Men are never convicted of their sins. Folks, if you ever encounter the living God, your opinion of yourself will change. And I don't know that we have any better example in the Scriptures than Saul, the Jew, the Pharisee. If ever there was a man in the history of the Jewish religion who epitomized what they stood for in terms of self-righteousness, this was the man. He was, you know, some people have more zeal than others. Well, this was the guy who had the most. This was the, the, the head, head guy on the zeal meter. He absolutely was set to become the greatest Jew, the greatest Pharisee that ever lived. He wanted to, he was confident in his righteousness. He was confident in his religion. He was zealous to the point of persecuting and killing Christians because they, he saw them as a threat to what he believed to be the truth. I mean, that's the power of darkness, folks, when you can believe something to the point of killing other people over it. And it's, and it's a lie. That's serious darkness. But Paul in his own eyes was a righteous man. Boy, he despised the Gentiles above all. Despised most of the Jews, most of the rest of his fellow Jews. But he despised, every, I mean, he just despised people based upon his own idea of righteousness. But one day something happened, didn't it? He had a bunch of soldiers with him, and they were riding towards Damascus. And something happened when all of a sudden there was a, lot, there was a noise, there was a, a thunder from heaven, there was a, a voice from heaven, I guess, and there was a light that shone all of a sudden. Paul was, one second he was on his horse, the next second he was on the ground blind. And a voice saying, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And something gripped his heart. And all of a sudden he realized, hey, I've, something's wrong here. I've been on the wrong road. Who are you, Lord? I'm Jesus whom you've been persecuting. In a moment of time, Saul, the self-righteous Jew, went from being a righteous man in his own eyes to describe himself as the worst of sinners. Later on, he would write, this is a faithful saying, worthy of all acceptance, that Jesus Christ, Christ Jesus, came into the world to save sinners, of whom I'm the worst, he says, but God saved me as an example. If God can save somebody like Paul, he can save anybody. That was, the, that was the, the thing that just drove him. Look what God did for me, and look what I was, and God, you know, this what a message I had to preach. But boy, Paul didn't go around trying to sweet-talk people to see how big a church he could build. He preached that men had to give up their lives and repent. And nobody's going to do that unless they really see themselves in the light of God's holiness. I can't possibly convince you of that. But I pray, I pray that God will, will in spite of me, in spite of us, will, will somehow convict people that have never really come face to face with the reality of what they are. It's so easy when you grow up in a church to just kind of absorb it, become part of the culture, as we've said so many times. But how many testimonies have there been of people who've grown up and all of a sudden one day it dawns on them, I'm a sinner. I have nothing to commend me before a holy God. Oh, if we could begin to see ourselves as we really are, as God sees us, man, it would take us down where we need to be in order to be lifted up. God doesn't want to grind us into the ground. He wants us to face reality. The fact is, if any one of us, as we come into this world, 
in ourselves with, with the best that we can do, if any one of us suddenly found ourselves in the presence of the holy God, we would be consumed in a moment. You wouldn't just be mildly uncomfortable. You would be gone. Our God is a consuming fire. There's nothing that can... I mean, sin and, and corruption cannot stand in His presence. It just goes like throwing a tissue into the fire or worse. But you know, we've got to come to the place where we understand just how helpless we are. Here, God's plan is to have a people with whom He lives in fellowship, in harmony forever. Now, is anybody here qualified in yourself to fulfill that vision? Well, not only is there anybody here who can fix what's wrong? Can we qualify ourselves by anything that we do? Something has to change. I mean, if people like us are going to, are going to somehow fulfill that vision, something has got to change radically. Well, if we can't do something, then somebody else has got to do the doing. And see, that's the heart of the gospel. The gospel is not about what we do. The gospel is, is about absolutely coming to a point of surrender where we understand there is nothing I can do. I am worth nothing. I have no merit. I have nothing to bring. I'm dependent upon the mercy of a loving God who sent his son to the cross for me. If I have any hope, it's that he will perform a miracle in my life and, and to give me a new heart and a new life. That's, that's my only hope. Oh, God, I just pray that somebody, this will dawn on somebody, that you thought you were okay. You thought that this was, you know, just accept the culture, just grow up and start, you know, sing happy songs, praise the Lord and all of that. Oh, God. There's any number of people here who could stand up and tell you what they went through and the crisis they came to. You know, people come to, come to the Lord different ways. My testimony is very different, but that's, that's okay. It's not where, how you get there, it's where you get. God has got to bring us to a place where we know that we have no hope in anyone except what he's done. The law of God is something every one of us has broken and we break. None of us can live up to his standard. The standard is not, you know, better than most. The standard is God. That's a pretty high standard. And the law of God demands the death of every sinner. That kind of makes a dire situation for us. It demands it. There's no exceptions to that principle. And so the only possible solution is the one that God provided in providing a sacrifice who stepped in and said, I will take their sin, their guilt upon me. Let the full wrath of the law that they deserve be vented upon me. I will satisfy God's, the demands of God's law so that they can go free. Do you think that someone can claim a blessing like that without giving up their life? Do you think someone can claim that and their intention is to go on and be as they are or reserve the right in this area, this area? Do you think you can negotiate with God and come to a kind of a accommodation where he lets you have your way here and there and the other. No, we're going to have to just lay it on and say, Lord, it's not my life anymore. I don't have the right to choose who I marry, what I do in life, where I go, what I where I live. I guess, you know, it was interesting in our, uh, this, last, this past Sunday, Jimmy and I were on a, our third of, these, of those live interview programs and and uh, Bridget was asking, I think the first question she asked was our testimony. And Jimmy gave his. And it was interesting in both cases, uh, both cases. In, in Jimmy's case, one thing he had to do was come to a place where he was willing to take the Lord even when his parents were opposed. And look his parents in the eye and say, I love you, but I'm, I love Jesus more. And it was so interesting how Bridget came back and said, you know, I went through exactly the same thing. And God's performed a miracle in that family. But my testimony was very different. I grew up in a preacher's home 
But I think the, the issue probably, if there was a particular one with me, was growing up in a missionary society where a lot of the emphasis for teenagers was, what are you, you know, are you going to surrender your life if the Lord wants to call you and send you to some jungle somewhere? Are you willing to just simply surrender and let the Lord be Lord of your life? And that was, that was the, I suppose as a teenager, that might have been the issue as, more than any other one that God used. But I, I don't care what the issue is, whether you love money like this rich young ruler, whether you love, you know, the pleasures, the, the physical stuff, or you, you, whatever it is that you love that has your heart. Just your love of, I want to do what I want to do. Nobody tells me what to do. If you have God, if you have Jesus, that has to go. Jesus, God, you know, God, God says, I will have no other gods before me. You go to churches today, they've got a lot of gods. A lot of people do. I know God has his people. Thank God, thank God for every one of them. But, oh, God, I, you know, I don't even know how to express it, but God has got to do the convicting. I, as I pray that God will somehow take these stumbling words and in spite of the stumbling, will just convict your heart that you are a lost, hopeless sinner without Jesus. Amen. How many times has the scripture in Matthew 7 been used where Jesus talked about two gates and two ways? Boy, we see the wide gate and the, or the, broad, and the broad way everywhere in our day. There's something being preached as the gospel of Jesus Christ that does not demand that they bow to Jesus as Lord. Amen. You read through that passage, that's the issue. Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and you don't do what I say? And how many will come on that day and they'll be, they'll be cast out as, as evildoers, as, as rebels, as lawless ones, it says in the Greek. People who will not be ruled over. Jesus is the setter. What we do with him determines eternity. I remember a hymn we used to sing when I was growing up, and it, it kind of took off on the theme of Jesus being before Pilate. And the question was, what will you do with Jesus? That's the name of the hymn. Jesus is standing in Pilate's hall. And, and, and this is the way the hymn begins. But the core is, what will you do with Jesus? I, 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 wish, I can't remember the words, I'm sorry. What will you do with Jesus? And someday your heart, the end of it is, someday your heart will be asking, what will he do with me? Because he is the one before whom we will all stand. He is the one. He will be sitting there on that throne. You're going to have to go up to him and answer for your life and what you did with him, whether you were willing to give up your life to serve him or you turned your back and went another way. There is no other gospel. You turn from this one. You can, you can go find you a church and they'll, they'll welcome you in. It'll, be, it'll seem great, but there's no other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved except the name of Jesus. He is the one who took our sins. He is the one who demands that we give up our life and follow him. And I, and I guess that's the question that, that God would answer, would, would ask of everyone. Where, where do you stand with respect to Jesus? This determines your eternity. And all I can do is just leave that between you and the Lord and just pray that God will convict your heart to the point that you will absolutely confess him as Lord and surrender and give up. You know, Jimmy spoke about the hounds of heaven. I guess it was in the taper. Afterwards, I can't remember. But uh, I'll tell you, if God is after you, if he's calling you, if he's on your trail, the only reasonable thing to do is just to say yes. Not a superficial yes, but a real yes. It's when the Holy Spirit comes and shows you your heart and it dawns on you what a hopeless, lost, helpless sinner you are. And it's when God calls and says, come surrender. That's the only time you've got. That's the day of salvation. That's the only opportunity. If God doesn't call you, if God doesn't draw you, you can't come. 
This is, this is a kingdom by invitation only. It's not the invitations that men give. It's the invitation of God to the heart. And so the question is, if God is calling you, what are you doing about it? I urge you to bow to Jesus Christ. He is Lord of heaven. Praise God. just want to go back <clears throat> just for a minute or two there where Phil was. Uh, I, I know some, some of us right here tonight in this meeting, some of us have had some nights this week we couldn't sleep. You know why? Because you can't get him out of your mind. That man, I believe he was anointed. You can't get him out of your mind. You know what our, you know what our problem is, beloved, is until we come to that place where we really see what Phil, God made it so clear, Jesus Christ is the absolute pivot point for everybody for all eternity. Your relationship to him, where you stand in relation to Jesus Christ is the only thing that matters. And what we don't understand is until our knees hit that ground before him. He is our adversary. And if your name's written in the Lamb's Book of Life, you can't get him out of your mind. You can't get him out of your mind. You can't get him out of your mind with sex. You can't get him out of your mind with Donald Trump's money. You can't get him out of your mind with a religious position in this church or any other. You can't get him out of your mind until you bow your knee. Agree with your adversary quickly. Some of us, we, we, we manifest this in different ways. Like I say, I know some have not been able to sleep, and it's because you can't get Jesus out of your mind. He's dealing with you. Some, some get agitated with their wife or their husband or their children or their parents. And it's because you can't get him out of your mind. Agree with your adversary quickly while you're in the way with him. Don't, don't make him deliver. It's his love. Don't make him deliver you to the judge. And the judge deliver you to the officer. Some of us have been there, beloved. And it's better to agree with your adversary quickly. Amen. I don't believe it was any coincidence or anything else that put this on Phil's heart tonight. I don't know if there's one somebody or 50 somebodies, but there's somebody God's dealing with. There's somebody that can't get him out of their mind. And beloved, give yourself rest and peace. Come down and just drink it in from Jesus. Jesus, the way, the truth, and the life. We can have all kind of knowledge and never come to the truth. He is the way, the truth, and the life. This has been the Midnight Cry broadcast. If you would like a DVD or a CD of today's message in its entirety, please request it by program number. DVDs are $10 and CDs are $5. And for those who request it, we will send you our quarterly publication, The Midnight Cry Messenger, free and postage paid. Send your request to Midnight Cry Ministries, Post Office Box 685, Southern Pines, North Carolina, 28388. We invite you to join us again next week at the same time, and may God richly bless you until then.